All right, chapter 13, the book of glory. Glory. It is, again, it is so thick. It is so rich that you can go over and over. I mean, I've been praying and reading this for 50 years, and it still has stuff in it. So I'm not going to plow through it all. I want to give you just the big overview. We read it every Easter season, weekdays, weekdays. I told you that, that coming up now, the Holy Week, we're going to start to uh, Monday reading from John, beginning the chapter 4 and then 5. So chapter 5 is the, the tension between Jesus and the Pharisees about Jesus healing the paralyzed man on the Sabbath. Then chapter 7, and then chapter 8, and then chapter 10. All of which are going to show growing tension between Jesus and the authorities. Then comes Holy Week, and then starts Easter. And um, after the first week of Easter, the Gospels are all resurrection appearances. But starting with the second week of Easter, we come back to John. We read chapter 3, Nicodemus, then chapter 6, the, the Discourse of Bread of Life, and then a the, uh, little bit of chapter 10, the, the, the Good Shepherd, and then we pick up this passage, okay? So we begin, it's the Last Supper. It's a shock to many, many clergy, but there is no institution of the Eucharist in John's Gospel at the Last Supper. It took place where? Chapter 6, as part of, the, as part of Jesus' discussion about eating my flesh and drinking my blood. So the material that John would have used to speak about the institution of the Eucharist has already been used in chapter 6. But instead, what does John provide? A whole other sacramental sign. We do the we Catholics do the Eucharist many times on a Sunday and almost every weekday and the foot washing we reserve to once in a year. So chapter 13, before the feast of the Passover when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of the world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. That is, to his end. This is when he takes a bowl of water, he takes off his clothes, he girds a towel around his waist, and he crawls around the ground to wash his disciples' feet. In verse 6, he comes to Simon Peter, and Simon Peter says, no, Lord, do you wish to wash my feet? And Jesus says, what I am going to do now, what I am doing you do not know now, but afterward you will understand. Peter says, you shall never wash my feet. This is, a, this is John's version of Simon Peter who means well, but doesn't understand really Jesus. Now, my suspicion is, that when you've heard this preached, you, it's been emphasized that this is all about Jesus teaching us to serve. It's that, but that's secondary. The first thing, the primary thing, I want you to get into your heads, the foot washing is a preparation for an introduction to the crucifixion. Jesus is almost naked when he washes their feet. The next day he will be naked on the cross. The, 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 the Last Supper, the bread and wine, this is my body, this is my blood, is a foretaste of his death. So is the foot washing. Jesus is, in a sense, witnessing, testifying to his self-emptying. That's why when Peter says, you shall not wash my feet, when Jesus says, if I don't wash your feet, that is, if you don't experience what this means, then you will have no life in you. See, because the foot washing is a foretaste of the crucifixion, the power that Christ let loose by his self-giving death. So then, <laughs> then Peter says, well, then if, if that, then wash all of me. And Jesus says, no, just the feet sufficient. The point is, you need to have, we need to be touched by the saving power of Christ. 
That's what this is about. After that, yes, you should do the same. But first, he has to touch us. We, we have to be made clean. We have to have his power flood through our lives before we can dare help anybody else. Do you follow that? It's, I know it's a little counter what you probably have heard most of the time. It's about service. Well, it is about service, but only after you let Jesus flood your little life and purify your dirty feet. Your feet stand for all the things about us that are most embarrassing, that are not what they should be. The cross needs to purify that. Okay, so that's what comes first. Then, then, verse, where am I, Mark? Um, verse 19. I tell you this now before it takes place, that when it takes place, you may believe that I am he. Right? Let's go back then. I will go back. Verse 12. When he had washed their feet and taken his garments and resumed his place, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. So there's the service part. But it comes second. First comes a little interaction with Peter, and that's all about applying Jesus' washing our feet, or the feet signifies they're taking on the grace that's let loose at the crucifixion. Then you can take it as a kind of service. Verse 42. Ah, no, I'm looking at the wrong page. Book 21. When Jesus had thus spoken, he was troubled in spirit and testified, Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of what he spoke. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was lying close to the breast of Jesus. Da -da -da! First appearance of the loved disciple. <laughs> Simon Peter beckoned to him and said, Tell us who it is of whom he speaks. So lying thus close to the breast of Jesus, he said to him, Lord, who is it? And then Jesus says, he with whom I have dipped a morsel. Now that line, he with whom I've dipped a morsel, is actually a verse from one of the Psalms. So Jesus quotes scripture. But the thing I want to point out is Simon Peter wants to know, he doesn't ask Jesus himself, he asked the beloved disciple. And the way there, now this is Passover, now this is not a Passover meal in John's gospel, but John wants you to imagine that they're laying down on couches, they're not on chairs, they're on couches, like spokes on a wheel with like a lazy Susan in the middle, they're all reaching in. So beloved disciple leans back on Jesus' chest and asks a question. That shows how close he is, huh? In fact, the lovely line, or, Rollheiser, Rollheiser, Richard Rollheiser, lovely image. To be a Christian is to be like a beloved disciple, to hear the heartbeat of Jesus in your ear as you look out at the world. That's, he, that's, you know, again, it doesn't say that in the text, but she, the beloved disciple leans back on Jesus' chest. He hears the heartbeat of Jesus in his ear while he looks at the world. I, I, that's a lovely the homily, a rich homily, right, in that one little line. Huh? Richard Rollheiser, not me. Okay? All my good stuff is really Peter. Peter has the good stuff, and I just hold it all the time. Okay. So then begins, so Judas leaves, and look at verse 30. After receiving the morsel, he immediately went out, and it was night. Da 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 da. Okay? And uh, the Judas is gone, and then begins Jesus' conversation. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and in him God is glorified. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Uh, at the end of the chapter, Peter says, Lord, I will not abandon you. And like we see in the synoptics, Jesus says, Tut, tut, Simon Peter. Um, you are going to deny me uh, 
then chapter 14 begins the discourse. You know chapter 14. It's, you know, I have lots of funerals here. And if I had a buck for every time somebody chose John 14, 1 through 6 at a funeral. Uh, so if you die while I'm your pastor, choose something else, please. I really i have run out of things to say. This is where Jesus <laughs> says, um, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many rooms. You can see why it's a favorite for people at a funeral. Huh? Um, when when I, I'm going now to prepare a place for you, when I come back, then I will take him to myself. Thomas asks, Lord, or says, Lord, we do not know the way. Where are you going? How can we know the way? Jesus says, I am the way. Again, I am, I am, I am the way and the, the truth and the life. I, no one comes to the Father except through me. Verse 8, Philip says, Lord, show us the Father and we shall be satisfied. Now, what can you say about that? That's just stupid. No one, remember, no one sees the face of God and lives. So Philip is just like asking a stupid thing, okay? And Jesus responds and says, have I been with you so long and yet you do not know me, Philip? Jesus' point is, you look at me, you see the Father. Jesus is the window on God. As much of God as we could ever hope to comprehend, we have seen in Jesus. Verse 10, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Verse 16, verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father and he will give you another counselor. What other translations do you have for counselor? Advocate, anything else? That's general. Paraclete, an old translation would have paraclete. That's the literal word. An advocate is a, is a gentle word, a churchy word for a lawyer. The one who speaks up for you. Okay? So not just a counselor like a psychological counselor, but somebody who speaks up for you in the courtroom in tough times. So who is that advocate? It's the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Verse 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. The Spirit comes up again in verse 26. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring you to your remembrance all that I have said to you. If you struggle with understanding, the Holy Spirit seems very vague to most of us. Huh? But John's language is well worth mining. The Spirit is the one who will teach us, leading us to all truth. In the Catholic Church, we hold that the Holy Spirit dwells in the church, lives in the church, not just the Pope, not just the bishops, but in the church, and is leading us to all truth. Okay? There's one more spirit reference, chapter 16, we'll get to. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Okay? Now, this is a lovely little Last Supper saying. And the end of the chapter, verse 31, rise, let us go hence, suggests that in an early version, that was the end of the Last Supper speech. Okay? But a later editor had so much Jesus stuff left over that he just continues on. <coughs> what follows in 15 is the vine of the branches, very organic. Notice how our how do we have life? By our connection to Jesus. He is the vine, we are the branches. We don't have life through each other. We have life through him. So all of us must be connected to him. Again, Peter's comment earlier about how John is a favorite gospel of 
of Christian evangelicals how important clinging to Jesus is. Not the church, not the pope, not the bishop. It's you and Jesus, me and Jesus. It, it's a Johannine thought. They didn't make it up. It's really there. It's not the only thing that's in the New Testament, but it's part of it. Notice how many times the word abide appears. I think it's 10 times. Hang on. Hang in there. Abide, abide, abide. Verse 12 of chapter 15, Jesus once again talks about the commandment of love. This is this which came up in 1334 after the foot washing. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Sidebar, I said it earlier, but let me say it again. In John's Gospel, there are no commands to love our enemies. There's no, there's no command even to love our neighbor as ourself. Doesn't appear in John's Gospel. Everything is focused on connection to Jesus and love for the Jesus people. I owe love to Jesus' friends. Those who are not his friends, I, there's nothing said about what I owe them. I'm not saying he says hate them, but in John's gospel, your obligation is to love the friends of Jesus. Which again, if John is the only gospel we had, it's, it, it would scare me. Because it's very sectarian. It's my little group. It's the hell of the world. It's all about us. So thank God there are four Gospels, not just one. Okay? Verse 18, this negativeness of the world comes into play. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Verse 23. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would, not have, they would not have sinned. But now they have seen and hated me both and my father. 26. But when the counselor comes, consult the counselor, the advocate comes, whom I shall send to you from the father, even the spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness to me, and you also are witnesses, because you have been with me from the beginning. I have said all of this to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he's offering service to God. Now, I read that this morning earlier, and you go, okay, okay, but now you hear it in context. When Jesus is talking about the world, the world hated me, so it will hate you. The world will think it's honoring God when it destroys you. So don't be surprised at that. Okay? Verse 13 is the last reference to the paraclete. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. Okay? Um, so now Jesus is beginning to wrap up the speech here. Look at verse 21, a lovely image. So says a unmarried male with no children. <laughs> when a woman is in travail, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she is delivered of the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a child is born into the world. You have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. Lovely passage. Verse 28, verse 27, verse 27. For the Father himself loves you 
because you have loved me and have believed that I came from the Father. I came from the Father and I have come into the world. Again, I am leaving the world and going to the Father. His disciples wake up and say, oh, oh, now we get it. You're speaking plainly. And uh, Jesus goes on, verse 31. Do you now believe? The hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered, every man to his own home, and you will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said this to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Now that would also be a good place to stop, huh? <laughs> but there's more. When I say the Lord's Prayer, you think, Our Father who art in heaven. In John's mind, there is no Lord's Prayer like that. But there is this. Jesus turns away from the disciples and turns to the Father, and he prays. It's a long prayer. First, he prays for himself, for what's about to come. Then he prays for the disciples, for their unity, and for what's ahead for them. And then the most remarkable passage, in my mind, and very selfishly, he prays for us. This little group. He had this group in mind that night. Let's look and see. Verse 1. Jesus looks up and says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. So this is, that's the first part. He's, he prays for his own glorification. See me through, that I may glorify you by doing what you've asked me to do. Verse 4, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you've given me to do. Now, Father, glorify you in, my, in your own presence with the glory which I had, I had with you before the world was made. Remember my little diagrams here? That Christ was with the Father from the, before the beginning of time. So Jesus is referencing that. Then, verse 6, he prays for the disciples. I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Verse 9. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. Verse 11. And now I am no more in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are one. So now comes the, the movement to the theme of unity. We talked about unity, where Steve, unity, here, not only in Paul, but here in the gospel, it is a preeminent need. Verse 13. Now I'm coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. It's good to remember what the, you know, what the forest is. We look at the trees so much. What is the forest? It's that we might have fu be fulfilled in God's joy. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. Okay? Then verse 20. Here's the part that gives me chills. I do not pray for these only, but also for those who believe in me on account of their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. What will prove to the world that we are God's children? Our ability to get along, our unity will make the world go, ooh, that's weird, that's different. Verse 24, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am, 
to behold my glory, which you have given me in your love for me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these know that you sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. This is Jesus' magnificent Last Supper farewell discourse from chapter 13, the very end, to chapter 17. We've read farewell discourses before. I think that's part of your homework was to compare and contrast. Moses gives a big farewell discourse. We call it Deuteronomy. Huh? Paul, in Acts 20, remember, he gathers the leaders of the church at Miletus, and he tells them that he's done what he can for them, but he may not see them again. They have the big group hug as they walk him down to the seaport. That's a farewell discourse. This is the grand farewell discourse of all farewell speeches. Okay? I want to tell a little story on myself. Some of you have heard this because I preached this. Um, my parish growing up, we, my pastor, God rest him, wasn't a great preacher. And every Good Friday, he read, he read the same homily, the same speech. And my parents, you know, we were churchgoers, and so we went every Good Friday. Huh? And we, the pierces always sat on the right-hand side of the church, about the third row. And the Hudson family sat on the left-hand side. Okay? And Jeff, Mark was in my grade. Jeff was one year behind. Mark and I were buddies, but Jeff and I, somehow, we clicked more. Um, uh, we, he went to seminary after he became a monk at St. John's, and, and I went my way. But anyway, I, I guess we're maybe like 17. I mean, really sassy, really sassy. We were getting to the, you know, and so there is our pastor reading this story. And it was really kind of really dramatic, you know, kind of over dramatic, because our pastor wasn't very dramatic. He, it's, it's about Jesus is watching the events of, of his death. He's on the cross, and he's looking around, and, and, and then the narrator says, and Jesus raises his eyes. He's looking down. He's looking for somebody. He's watching for someone. He's looking down the centuries, the 16th, the 17th, the 18th century. Jesus is looking for me. I mean, he read it kind of like that. So Jeff's on that side, and I'm on this side. And it's always the same every year. And so, so we get to that point. I look at him, and he looks at me, and we go, in the, the, the middle aisle, so it's like this distance. <laughs> Nobody ever slapped him down. That's what you're thinking happened. But you know, I kind of, I kind of, we kind of mocked our pastor, you know. But I, you know, it's true. It's true. Jesus has this, had this gathering in mind on his cross when we gather on Sunday. Being divine, he had that gathered. He had every time we meet, he had us in mind when he prayed this prayer. Jesus is looking for me. So I say, God bless you, Father Peter. I apologize for all the crap I always gave you, but um, it's true. Questions. Or maybe we should stop and let her go away, and then we can have questions. Where is Marianne? She's not here. She left. No, she didn't. Her equipment is here. Who's got a question? So, you talked about um, the Sunday service being unknown. I have a comment to you. Share my joy with the Jesus. We're sharing his joy with the Father. But he's what? Jesus' joy with the warmth of the Father. Yeah, well, no. That, that by finishing his work, by finishing the work the Father gave him, our joy, our, we will have the fullness of life. Remember, eternal life, that we might have joy and have it now and have it in abundance. That's from chapter 10. So Jesus is going to be joy and glory because he's finishing his work, but for his disciples around him at the table. Because until Jesus completes his work, we don't have our feet washed. We don't gain eternal life. Other questions about the text?
brought you numb. You're numb. Yeah. A lot of words. Okay, let's take a break then. All right? Take a long break. Then we'll have. Then we'll look at uh, your exam, and we'll look at your at your homework. Okay. Good luck. Two o'clock. Uh, no, not two o'clock. That would be too long. Um, how about five to two? Five to two. Yes, sir. You know, I still remember it's, it's, yeah, that the okay, yeah. water jar <laughs> and the declaration yeah, part that someone yeah. taught us. Yeah. The partition, you know, in those. In those oh, yes, those, a series. Those five years ago. Yes, yes. There's a four gospels in Isaiah. That one was at Toma, that one. But yeah. Yeah. But it's a very too close. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, Indeed. Uh, is it just, I remember just, what a revelation that was. It is. Yeah, it's like. Get the story down. And yes. the fact that God was more affirmative of women than men. Oh, Luke? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Luke, I just tried that. It's really John. Yeah. yeah, I always remember that. Very good. Green. 